Uh, today I'm going to talk about my PhD project and um, the, 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 the development and where I'm at uh, at the moment. So the title of the project is Examine the Financial and Operational Performance of Box Simpson CSAs uh, in the UK to evaluate their potential to scale up. <coughs> So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about myself and what I used to do before I um, came to, co to CORE. Um, I uh, worked with Sarah in a project called Capital Growth where we helped start uh, over 2,000 community gardens in London. And from 2012, I uh, co-owned uh, a small um, um, farm business that was uh, based here in the London Borough of Sutton. So because we were within London, uh, we used to sell to um, uh, box schemes in, in London. This is a, a picture of the farm. Um, we were subletting uh, from uh, tenants that were um, renting from the council um, and we were split into sites. Um, so in, in this site, um, we had one fully functioning greenhouse, a small shed and half of a greenhouse and then this sort of weirdly L-shaped field. And then on the other field, on the other side, we had two greenhouses that were more or less falling apart and I used to plant with my cycling helmet just to make sure that the glass wouldn't kill me in my head. And then, and then um, we had this field that um, we used to um, 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 uh, grow uh, field scale crops uh, with tractors and um, machinery. This is a picture of this field uh, when we grew our squashes. Uh, and, and we were using these types of um, 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 tractors, which were from like the 1950s, so nothing fancy. Uh, and then this is a picture of the shed. So this, this is the shed, and it was tiny, and in it we used to store all our tools, um, eat our food, and also pack all the vegetables that we were selling. So it, it was a very, very small space for all, for all those functions, and potentially not really allowed. Um, so, um, so that's that's me and what I what I used to do. Um, so I have a picture of a meal, and I've carefully chosen vegetarian um, because I see what I'm doing right now as putting a meal together. So my PhD is like putting a meal together with that that has and, and that meal has different um, ingredients. And so I think that right now I have managed to identify what the ingredients are and get them to start cooking in my head. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about those ingredients today. There are three of them. Um, so the first one is the aims and objectives of the PhD. The second one is the theoretical framework that I'm using um, for the PhD. And then the third one is the results of the National Box Scheme Survey. So how I want you to think about this is I know that these ingredients ultimately will become this meal, but I'm not quite sure if it's actually going to taste good. <laughs> um, so hopefully it will. Um, OK. So the the first um, ingredient is the is the aims and objectives so at the left hand side is the aims and objectives that i had at the beginning of the phd which uh, were sort of set up by in, in collaboration with moya um, julie and ulrich and then what i have at the moment so the, the, aim, the aim of the PhD that I, that I have at the moment is the, to examine the financial and operational performance of boxing to CSAs in the UK to, to evaluate the potential to scale up. So um, at the beginning, we were thinking of um, this, this idea, these two concepts, community-led trade and alternative food economy. And those concepts were a bit pie in the sky. It wasn't quite well defined what they meant and obviously in the academic literature you, you, you couldn't find um, um, uh, definitions of those two concepts. So it, it was a bit too wide. So we d I decided to narrow it down to boxing to the CSAs. Um, the, the other thing was this idea of uh, assessing the economic value, impact and scalability. Um, as you know, there isn't that much data or 
publish academic work on how the, the boxing and CSA sector work in the UK. So I've, I felt that it was better to take a step back and first understand how the sector works in, in order to then um, examine the, assess the economic value impact and scalability. So um, because of those changes, the objectives change as well. So um, the, the first objective that I have now is to carry a benchmark study. Before, the, the idea was to develop indicators to assess economic scale, value, and impact. But I feel that by um, making the objective about making a benchmarking study, the, 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 there is a shift to concentrate on the process of coming up with those indicators rather than, to, than on the end product it, itself. I don't know, I'm, I'm going to do a benchmarking study, I'm, I'm going to collect data on different things that I think are useful, and then the idea is that once I have that, I can take that to different people, like um, the, the people that are here with us today, or uh, I don't know, uh, perhaps Trios Bank or funders, and they can tell, tell us whether they feel that those things that I've measured are useful for them, and what other things they would like to see in a benchmarking study. Um, the second uh, objective is to identify differentiation techniques box teams and CSAs are implementing. So differentiation techniques are basically ways in which um, and these enterprises differentiate themselves from uh, other enterprises, like from supermarkets or other food retailers. And to me, these differentiation techniques are um, the way in which box teams and CSA can, can actually go to customers and say, you have to pay us more for this product because it's better. So that means um, organic, local, uh, paying the living wage to um, the, 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 the workers of, of the enterprise, etc. But I think these differentiation techniques are also linked to values. So they are the, they are, so they, they are sort of the materialization of a set of values that an enterprise has. Um, and then finally, the third objective is to assess the potential of box teams and CSAs to scale up. So we had that, that objective at the beginning as well. What I'm gonna do now is to look at it through the values-based supply chain framework, which I'm gonna describe later what, what it is about. So we move on to the second ingredient, uh, um, which is the theoretical framework. So what I'm gonna do here is um, talk about um, short food supply chains and, uh, and the values-based supply chain. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, sorry, and then what I'm gonna do is compare in, in two different uh, points uh, these two ideas. So, as you know, Moya and um, a lot of researchers in the UK have been working on this idea of short food supply chains. Um, so, in, in the earlier papers, it says that short food supply chains re-socialize and re-spatialize food. And that's just a fancy way to say that they connect farmers with growers and that they supply local food. Um, they, um, the, the one, one important aspect of, of the, the idea of short food supply chains is that when the product reaches the, the consumer, it's, it has, it, it's embedded with information and that means that the consumer, by having the product, knows the values of the product and the values of the producer of that product. And when the consumer knows this, they make a value judgment, which means that they say, okay, yeah, this has better values than, I don't know, something that is being brought from somewhere else and people don't get paid well. And so therefore they buy that product that has values. Um, some um, definitions of short food supply chains include uh, the number of intermediaries, and um, for example, the French Agricultural Ministry, um, they adopted a definition of short food supply chains, um, and that is uh, systems for the sale of products which include a minimum or only one intermediary between producer and consumer. So they, they are quite, they, they, in, in the, the, the French Agricultural Minister, what they're trying to do is to define that they're actually, uh, that there should be either one or no um, intermediaries. Um, some um, 
uh, definitions also include that the producer should retain the most amount of money in the economic transaction. And, and um, as part of uh, the EPIAGRI research uh, that Moya, Ulrich, and other people here at the center carried out, they did, um, they did a focus group of experts, and um, in the focus groups, the experts also suggested that the definition should include uh, uh, that the supply chain partners work together. Um, so, values-based supply chain. So, this concept is mostly been developed in the U.S. Um, and um, and what it is is a collaborative business networks who jointly plan and coordinate their activities to achieve common financial goals whilst advancing an agreed upon set of social and environmental values. So I really like this definition uh, because it, it goes right to a point to say it's, it's not only about keeping the farmers in business, but it's about keeping everyone in the supply chain in business uh, and, 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 and making sure that everyone is financially sustainable. So, um, in, in values-based supply chains, it doesn't matter how many intermediaries there are, as long as they are working collaboratively with each other. And what the framework suggests is that instead of, um, is, is that it, um, it's, a, it's a set of strategies to, to be able to work together in collaboration. So the, the first strategy is that um, um, partners in the supply chain cooperate with each other and they compete against other supply chains that um, the second one is that um, the firms within the supply chain uh, perform really well um, and, that, and that they trust each other. Um, the, the third one is uh, that they share a vision. So they share a vision for the types of products that they want, to, they want to sell and they share information with each other so that they can optimize their, their operations and they also decide, they, they make decisions together up about the, pro the products that they are uh, trying to get to market. So, for example, one of the ways in which they make decisions together is that they all decide the price of the product and then from that they, they decide how much is going to go to each of the partners within the supply chain. And then the final st strategy is support for strategic partners. So that is mainly about the economics, that everyone in the supply chain has to make enough money um, in, 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 um, in, 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 the, in the making of a product. So I'm going to um, uh, do a little bit of comparison between these two uh, ideas, these two concepts. So um, uh, from, in terms of values, um, we have short food supply chains, so uh, the concept of short food supply chains talks about the values of the products, the values of the producers, um, but, um, but what they mostly talk about is how those values are transmitted to the product and they mostly explore this through um, relationships between producers and consumers and that's why they use a lot of examples in farmers' markets because that's where people um, sort of talk to each other. Um, so, so in a way, the short food supply chains are focusing on um, the relationship between consumers rather than the, the values of the products or, or the producers. But this, this, this way of talking about values and relations um, it's what um, some academics have called the local trap or the conflation of spatial and structural characteristics and behavior. So that means that is, is this assumption that, um, that the local scale is ecologically sustainable or is socially just or is democratic or has better nutrition, is fresher or, has, or is be of better quality. So we, so there is no way to assure that actually these things are happening and the short food supply chain um, concept doesn't quite question if those things are happening, but it's, it's more about the relationship. Instead, the values-based supply chain, what they do is that they, they divide values uh, into values of the products and values of the people taking part in the supply chain. So the, the, the values of the products can be any, any values, 
but the idea is that the, that the people that take part in the supply chain agree with each other what they're going to be, and they ensure that all the firms within the chain uh, can accomplish that, that, um, that value. So, for example, if it's quality, um, yeah? Conf <laughs> Good. Um, conflation is when you sort of mix together two things. Um, uh, it's, it's when um, you uh, assume one thing because of another. So, for example, you, as you, have, you, you are sold a local product, so you assume that that local product is sustainable, it's, um, um, it has better nutrition, it's fresher, just because they, said, they tell you that it's local. So that is conflating. So you're confusing one local for a set of other values. Yeah. So it, it could be a local egg that comes from a factory farm. Exactly. Exactly. But, but they tell us oh, it's local, so it's good enough. Yeah? Well, That's okay. Um, uh, so, yeah, so values by supply chains divides the, the values. And then, so, so you have the values of the products and then the values of the actors taking part. So, so for example, you can have um, a, a values-based supply chain that sells organic um, uh, produce, but that also uh, quite explicitly um, uh, pays their employees uh, at the living wage, let's say. Um, <clears throat> so another... Um, um, thing that I want to compare is how this concept is applied to analyze data. So in the, in the example that I'm going to use uh, for sure food supply chain is the impact project that um, gave birth to, to, to this concept and, and it was developed through these two academic papers. Um, so the idea of the impact project was to Create, to have an overview of the spread and impact of short food supply chains in Europe. So the, when the authors set out, set out to do this, they created categories to put the different supply chains, short food supply chains in. And they, they came up first with categories of how the, produ the product is sold. So it's all face to face, Special proximity is sold, for example, in delis or cafes within the local area, or is especially extended, is sold in supermarkets. And then they created two more categories. Um, so regional quality are uh, products that have a designation of origin or cottage foods, on-farm processed foods, or foods that are processed in a traditional way. And then the other, um, uh, quality was, or characteristic was um, ecological. So the idea was that they would put case studies in, in this diagram to show w which characteristic they, they align themselves with. So for example, case a, a short food supply chain A um, sells regionally their products, but there are more um, a designation of origin products, let's say. And then case study B, um, it's, they are more ecological products, but they are um, sold within a region, but also maybe within a country or even outside of that country. Um, so when they came to actually answer the question of what is the spread and impact of short food supply chains in Europe, they couldn't use that framework because that framework was mostly uh, used for case studies. It, it required a lot of uh, qualitative data. And, and, and in order to have a, a, an idea of what's happening in Europe, they needed more quantitative data. So, so instead, what they did is that they gathered data on uh, organic farming, quality production. So organic farming, because obviously we have the organic labels, so it's easy to collect data on that. Quality production, because we have the designation of origin labels that also collect data and then direct selling, I don't know how they got the data, but um, that's how they did it. So that sort of proves that if you want to look at a larger scale, certain methodologies don't quite work. So instead, the values-based supply chain um, 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 framework was used to look at, at food hubs in the US. Um, so 
um, the department, the US, the USA, USDA, US Department for Agriculture, um, recognize that as small and medium farmers have a, th there is a lack of distribution and infrastructure services for small and medium farmers, but also that there was a demand for local and regional food. And, and so they thought that food hubs in the US were providing the, the infrastructure and services needed, and they also could move high volumes of, of food. And so they established a collaboration between uh, the Wallace Center, which is a, a charity in the US, and the Center for Regional Food Systems at Michigan State University. And together they have been researching the food hub sector uh, now for a while. So they have created this body of work, which I've been looking at very closely. Um, and they, they started with this first um, um, uh, document called the Regional Food Hub Resource Guide. So they created a, a survey, they sent it out to food hubs in the US, and, um, and, and then they got answers back. And then through these different uh, benchmark studies and surveys, they have been sort of polishing the, the survey and um, um, getting informa the information that is most relevant for, for food hub coordinators, for people that are um, trying to finance, uh, lend money to food hubs, for uh, people, uh, farmers that are trying to sell into food hubs. So <clears throat> the latest version, which is this one, it, it, touch, it gathers data on these different aspects. So uh, it gathers data on operational characteristics, finances, values, services and activities, uh, challenges, opportunities, and, and barriers to growth. So just to clarify wh to, to, to what, I'm to what I mean by food hubs and what the food hubs that are here are talked about, these are, these are enterprises that aggregate and distribute food. That's the, that's the main um, uh, purpose of, of these food hubs. And they try to, set, to buy from small producers, but sometimes to keep demand all year round, they also buy from wholesalers. Um, and, then, and then their main aim is to sell high volumes. So, um, so they, they try to serve institutional buyers, they try to sell into restaurants, they try to sell into um, uh, catering, um, and then sometimes they have retail units themselves, but also um, they may have a box scheme attached to their operation. So they, they're just trying to move high volumes of produce which is, the, I suppose, the main difference with, um, with box skins. That, um, they, they are trying to sell on an on a individual basis, I suppose. So we can conclude from the theoretical framework that short food supply chains and the work that is being done around this concept, it's very much about looking from afar what's going on in practice and trying to put into categories all these different behaviors and then I think that the values-based supply chain, what it's trying to do is to, is to try to create research mechanisms that can, that can help the sector develop through, for example, benchmark studies, surveys, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously, um, because of my background, uh, wh what I used to do before um, uh, starting the PhD and, and this always idea that, you know, we, we the sector needs to be looked at. People need to make enough money to survive. Um, I, I have chosen the, the values-based supply chain framework as, as the framework for my work. So I'm gonna move on to the, to the last um, uh, ingredient, and that is the National Box Scheme and CSA Survey. So um, at the beginning, I was very concentrated on, on box schemes um, because I know, them, I know them well from having supplied them. Um, but when I was designing the survey, I started wondering whether to include CSAs because I couldn't quite work out what was the difference between box schemes and CSAs in terms of financial management and operational management. And, um, and, and so I looked at the, the CSA website and it, it, it says that CSAs are, are enterprises where people are more involved in the running of the CSA. But I am a member of Five Acres and I have to confess that 
I don't get involved at all. So for me, it could be a box scheme. It, there isn't that much difference for me as a, as a consumer. So I thought, well, if, if, I, if that's my experience of it, then maybe I should include CSAs um, just to maybe find more differences or, or maybe they are quite the same, I don't know. So, um, so, the, so I had 49 responses to the survey. I did quite a lot of um, um, outreach uh, to box teams and CSAs. I um, compiled a list of 250 enterprises that, are, that are, I think are mostly in, the, in England and Wales. Um, and then the, the, the survey has five sections. So type of box team and CSA, so I just try to maybe ask questions to create some sort of typology in, in terms of um, uh, financial and operational management. Um, the enterprise logistics and operational information, uh, information about employees and volunteers, business financial information, and demographics of the people that are running the, the, box, the box teams and CSAs. So I'm just going to show you uh, uh, some um, uh, uh, results that I have. It's not the whole thing, but it's just some bits that I've picked out. So, how many box scheme service CSAs answered the survey? So I had 35 box schemes and 14 CSAs, a total of 49 responses. Um, and this, this idea of type, I have been quite obsessed with um, aggregation because, look, because of looking at food hubs in the US, I, I, I think that ag aggregation is perhaps the way forward. So I wanted to find out whether box teams and CSAs were aggregating. So I asked, so I created three categories. Are CSAs and box schemes buying and growing, just buying or just growing? So this is the spread that I got, 25, 10, and 14. So out of those that are buying, so that are only buying or buying and growing, how are they buying? So the majority are buying directly from farmers, but also from wholesalers, 29. Only one buys direct from farmers, and then five only buy from wholesaler. And then in terms of financial performance, I asked the question, what was the financial performance of your enterprise the past year? So I don't have a, a financial uh, data to, to back this up but this is what the enterprises told me. So, um, and, I, and I created four categories. I created other because I just, I wanted to make the question um, require, but I suppose I also, if people didn't want to say, then I just put other. So we have three others, and I don't know if it's because they have no idea or, or because they don't want to tell me that they failed or I don't know. So anyways, 24 made a profit, which is the good news. Um, the majority of them survive. Um, nine broke even and 13 made a loss. So what I did next was to start making relations between these different um, uh, questions. So the first relation I wanted to see was, are box schemes or CSAs more, uh, more viable? And, um, and I, so I had, 19 box schemes saying that they had made a profit, but obviously it's hard to compare with CSAs because the numbers in the sample are different. So what I did was to create percentages within the sample to make the comparison. So 54.3% of box schemes uh, make a profit, where only 35.7% of CSAs make a profit, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I suppose, um, the two biggest numbers in the, in, the, in, the bo in the box schemes are that they make a profit and that they made a loss, where the sample from the CSA is more evenly spread out. So it's almost a third makes a profit, a third makes breaks even, and a third makes a loss. Um, so then the, the other relation that I did was uh, this idea of buying, buying and growing, or just buying. And, and then related to whether people make a profit. So in the table, the biggest number is 12, and those are box schemes and CSAs that are buying and growing produce, make a profit. Um, 
which I suppose is, is, is not surprising um, uh, because I suppose a combination of both sort of spreads the risk of the enterprise. But equally, um, the second highest number is nine in the table, and, and those are also people that, uh, enterprises that buy and grow produce. So maybe there is also a, a risk as associated with that. And then those that are, those that are buying, um, how, do, um, how do they buy? So um, those that just buy produce, only one was buying from wholesaler, but the majority is, is buying direct from farmers and wholesalers. So those enterprises, they are growing, they are buying direct from farmers, and they're buying from wholesalers. So it, the, 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 the products in the box are quite, they're, they're coming from different so, uh, source uh, places. And I think also what this is, is showing me is the importance of wholesalers in the whole equation of, of box schemes, which I, I feel it is, a, it is a part that has been um, not researched very much, but that they play quite a significant role in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, oper in the operation of boxings and CSAs. Um, and finally, of those that are buying, how do they perform? And again, those that are um, buying directly from farmers and wholesalers, so they are doing a mix, are the most profitable. So the, the next thing that I looked at was employment and volunteers. And I wanted to find out, I wanted to answer three questions. How many employees does it take to run a box scheme CSA on average? Um, what are the average wages that are paid to box schemes and CSAs? And if the enterprise could afford those wages? Um, unfortunately, I, so far I have been able to answer two questions, so I, I don't have answers for the last one. So, I asked for uh, boxing and CSAs to give me details of their employees, so I managed to get 78 employee records from CSAs and 20 employee records from, for um, CSAs. And what I used was a, um, a full-time equivalence measurement. So the full-time equivalence measurement is, for example, that you have five employees in your enterprise, but those employees each work one day a week. So the full-time equivalence, the FTE, is one because these five people represent one full-time employee. So what I did is I um, converted all the information that they gave me on, on their employees into FTEs for the enterprise, but obviously having that number wasn't useful because box schemes are of, and CSAs are of different sizes, so it's not a comparable number. So what I did is I divided that number for the number of customers of that box scheme of CSA. So let's say in this case it's 50. So that gives me a number that I can compare with other box schemes and CSAs. And so I plotted these numbers in a scatter diagram and, um, and I divided it into box schemes and CSAs. So it turns out that the FTE for box schemes and CSAs is in a range between, uh, the majority are in a range between 0 0.005 and 0 .0 0 0.0100. And then for CSAs is between uh, 0 0.0097 and 0 0.0414. What does this mean? I, what I did was to, to find a median value within that range to say this is the average FD that is needed for a box scheme or CSA. And then I plotted that with uh, uh, X number of customers. So for box schemes, for a box scheme of 50 customers, you need 14.6 uh, 14 hours of work per week. For 100, you need 28.12 hours of work. Now for CSAs, obviously that, that number is a lot higher because a lot of CSAs are doing the growing. So um, 49.5 hours for a, box, for a CSA of 50 customers, 99 hours for a, box scheme, for a CSA of 100 customers. And also what I compare was how, how many full-time and part-time workers there are in these two types of enterprises. So, 
we have that box schemes, most people in box schemes work part time, where in CSAs uh, there is a spread between part time and full time. But there's also quite interestingly people that are working more than the 37.5 hours a week, which is the average week in the, in the UK, or working week in the UK, where in, in box schemes that's, that's, I mean, there is people doing that, but not as much. And then when it comes to wages, um, obviously I use the benchmark of the UK living wage, which is £8.45, and the London living wage, 9.75. And um, what I did is I uh, got all the wages into um, wages per hour and, and I calculated the mean, which is the standard average, the medium, which is the medium value, and the mode, which is the most or current or likely value. Um, so I did those three calculations and for box schemes, because I knew that there was box schemes in London, I separated those in London from the rest of the UK to be able to compare the wages. And obviously they, per they performed really well. They were a, a lot higher than um, the London living wage. And then for UK wages, in, in all three measurements, um, they were equal to the, to the UK living wage or slightly above in the case of the standard average. But when you look at the range of the wages, th there is people that are getting paid 2.27 pounds per hour all the way to 17.7 pounds per hour, 73 pounds per hour. So it is quite a big range and I think 2.27 pounds per hour is no good news. <laughs> and then for CSAs, I found that the, the price, the, the wages are lower. So um, again, same calculations. I didn't, I, uh, in the sample, I didn't have any London CSA, so I didn't do that calculation. So we can see that the standard average is just a little bit below the UK living wage. The median value is nine pounds and then the mode, the most current one was 13 pounds. But again, the range is quite critical because the lowest um, um, wage per hour was one pound 26 per hour. And that the highest was 13 pound 41 per hour. Um, so, also what I did was to ask, what do people sell? And I, I, I gave, uh, one, two, three, I think five or six options. Uh, so vegetables, fruit, eggs, bread, meat, fish, and then from whole foods up to wine, um, people told me, I, I used a, a, an other question and people told me what they were selling as well. So these are, these are the categories that, that the respondents came up with themselves. So obviously most people are, are, are selling vegetables, but quite a lot are also selling fruit and eggs. So what I did also was to look at the combinations. What, what, are, the, what are the most repeated combinations of, of products that people are selling? So the most popular combination is vegetables, fruit, and eggs. 13, 13 uh, enterprises are selling it. Vegetables and fruit, uh, which I mean, I, I, I know from experience, a lot of, peop a lot of enterprises do 10, 10 enterprises, and then just vegetables, seven, seven enterprises. And then it just goes on to all the different categories. I'm not, I'm, well, I'm actually surprised that meat and fish made it to um, fifth, where it's, it's hard to sell meat and fish through box skin because you need to make sure that it's chilled and all that. Um, so perhaps it will be interesting to um, get a case study that does meat and fish to see how they do it and whether it's viable for them. And that's my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>